Hello. Good morning. Did everybody get a band? Actually, if you did not get a band, raise your hand. Okay. Could we get bands to those who didn't get a band? You need two? Wait, could you come up here? Thank you for coming up here, Tito, because you have an announcement today, don't you? Today is a special day for someone. Oh, yes. It's my daughter's birthday. Is that an announcement? That it? Yeah. Eight years with me. So I'm super excited. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, thank you. just open in prayer real quick. Papa, we love you. We acknowledge your love, Spirit. We acknowledge your presence, not only within us, those who know you, but among us. We pray that you have your way in this place, in every square inch of this place. We ask that you continue to bless it. We consecrate it and claim it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So it's always kind of interesting to use props like this. It's not necessarily a prop because I can wait until the very end and keep people in suspense, or I can tell you up front what's happening and what's going on. So what's your preference? See, you're always going to get like half the people are going to say, no, we, uh, we love the tension. And other people are going to, no, I hate the tension. I'm going to do both. It's a compromise, my life of compromise. Welcome those online. Uh, thank you for viewing this. Uh, we are the Vineyard Church of Katy. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Skip, and I am... Uh, Contrary to what happened this morning, yet again in intercessory prayer, I am not the other Jeff. I got called that again today, the other Jeff, which is actually not bad. I don't mind it. I, I love it. Um, but we get that all the time. Do you get it as much as I do? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeff gets called the other Jeff. Sometimes people think we're um, interchangeable. Uh, but I am Skip, I am one of the elders here, and I am one of the teaching pastors here, and it is my pleasure to share the message. For those who love to take notes, I'm going to disappoint you this morning. Charlie just went, eh. Because part of what I'm going to give away is we are very important people. We are very important people. Everything we've been reading about and that I'm going to share today, my portion of the journey of the story that we're on, happens because we are very important people to who? To God. So you don't have to take notes. You're very important people. But you're also a very important person as part of the people. So note number two, you've already got it on your wrist. I am a very important person. To who? And to who else? Each other. See, to be a people, you have to have persons, right? So we can't be part of a people if we don't have each other. Now, we're a local expression of the larger ecumenical body right? So there, those are the main notes. And by the way, there aren't going to be, there'll be some critical points that I'll point out along the way, but at the end, there are going to be some things to focus on. So I'm just letting you know, there aren't going to be like, here's my five major points. Those were my major points right there. Now I'll tell you a quick story before we get into the story. Where this all came from actually began without having anything to do with the teaching. So you see I have a couple of other bands on my arm, on my wrist. Uh, that is because some of us, I know everybody can't, so 
take a deep breath. I know everybody cannot go visit people in the hospital. You don't all have time. Those of us that have had time to go visit Chuck, every time you go to, and by the way, for those online and, and guests that are here today, Chuck is our dear friend and brother who is in MD Anderson. He's been there a couple weeks. He's gonna be there possibly another week. Right now he's in a fight with leukemia. And every opportunity that we get to go visit him, we do. Well, when you go to MD Anderson, when they check you in, you get one of these white wristbands. Now, Chuck didn't know this, and a couple of you wondered about it because you asked me about it this morning. Notice that I wear it days after I've gone to visit Chuck. Well, the reason I do that is it reminds me to pray for him. And not just for Chuck. It reminds me to pray. It reminds me to pray for us and for the world and for everything God puts on our heart. And so normally what I do is I keep it on until the next day that I go. And then when I get the new one, I take the old one off and I throw it away, which also gives me an opportunity because people say, why did you keep that other one on? It's been five days. It gives me a chance to tell them why, because I pray for my brother every, you know, every time I feel this, I'm a risk. Okay. So yeah, I think you get the gist. So I was talking to Chuck yesterday and I said, hey, would it be okay with you? If I got some of these things for everybody that I'm going to be talking to tomorrow, because I wanted to check with him first. This isn't like some gimmick. This is a real thing. And I wanted him to bless it first. And he said, sure. Uh, because by the way, Chuck was helping me polish off the message. Anything good is from Chuck. Anything that falls flat is from me. So he said, sure. So. I went to the party store. Now, this is funny because it's going to tie to the teaching. Now, I want you to follow me as I follow the Spirit. So I go to the party store, and next to the party store is a liquor store. Now, I'm in my 38th year of regeneration and renewal from alcoholism. And I, w I wasn't tempted to go in, so I'm not trying to tell you there was some great temptation I just smoke marijuana to cut. No, I don't do that. <laughs> I cover that with chocolate. I don't cover it. Okay, no. I. Anyhow, so here's this liquor store. And I'm like, oh, that's odd. And I'm going into a party store. That's odd. So I ask them if they have these things, these wristbands. They go, sure, we have them. Well, they show me the selection, and they're all about drinking, and you know, they've got cocktails on it, they've got this and that, and, that, and they didn't have any plain white ones. And the only one they had that I thought we could use was the one that you have now. And I thought, well, Lord, they don't have the plain ones. I didn't want this to be, you know, pink and VIP. And, and the Spirit said, that's the one I want you to use. And I'm like, why? And then what you heard earlier was why? Because you're a very important people to me. And this ties directly to, are you following me? Right? And I'm not super spiritual. I'm not telling you to, you know, I'm just telling you when you listen to the Spirit, really funny things happen, and then you end up wearing wristbands because someone else listened to the Spirit. So that's where the wristbands came from. I'm going to bring it up at the end because, as we've been doing throughout this series, we're leaving, we're, we're not leaving you, we are all participating in a practice. And so this is actually going to tie to the practice that we're going to participate in together this week. So that is the origin of the wristbands. I hope you enjoy them. So the story, we're also going to try to use our magic device to advance slides. Let's see if it works. Holy smokes, it works too good. Man. One more. Okay. Repeat, 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 repeat. So together, what is the gospel? The incredibly great news 
that God loves the world so deeply that he came in Jesus Christ to rescue the world once and for all from sin, Satan, and death, and to restore the world to life with him today and forever. This is the gospel. These are words to remember. These are words to use. The words aren't magical, y'all. This isn't some kind of incantation. It is a straightforward representation of what he's done and who we are in him. The very important people that he rescued. And there are more very important people out there who need rescuing. All right, we're going to have fun with this to a point. Ah! And then I'm going to give up on it. Okay, now, I also want to remind us I have a second prop. And I'm also going to put a shameless plug in for Serenity Retreat. I happen to be at a Truth Summit out in Belleville Retreat with Serenity Retreat. And we have a saying in transformational prayer that we need to get God's perspective. And when you get God's perspective, you get to put these glasses on because we see the world through lenses. We want to see them through God's lens. We want God's perspective. Well, this really applies here as well because in the, in the story, there's an upper story and there's a lower story. And the upper story is God's perspective and God's desire and God's design. And in the lower story, we see it played out in our lives. But it's important that we view what we're experiencing in the lower story through the lens of the upper story. What is God trying to accomplish? We're going to see a bit of that in the reading today. But whenever you hear me talk about the upper story versus the lower story or seeing what God is doing, just remember this. We've got to see it through God's lenses and with his perspective and in his truth. Okay, last prop. That was it. All right. And Tina, I'm going to get frustrated. Go ahead and, and advance it for me because it's not working. All right, I want you to remember the journey that we're on is participatory. This is a bit repetitive. Repetition's not always bad. Sometimes we need to hear it two or three times. Sometimes we do need to write it down, Charlie. This is a participatory spiritual journey that we are experiencing as we what? Now remember, our mission as Katie Vineyard we invite everybody else to join us if they choose, and they are, in their own words, we partner with God, reflecting his love and continuing the mission of Jesus Christ together. You've heard me say this before. It starts with, there are bookends in our, in our vision. We, very important people, together, very important people. Yes, you're a very important person, part of a very important people. Previous key points, I also like to emphasize what's been taught before, or reemphasize, and Jeff has shared this with us earlier. God established a covenant relationship, and he honors it. Then, and you're going to see that, and he honors it today. Now, the covenant we're under today is a different covenant than the one they were under when these things were taking place. But the important point is not that the covenants are different, but that God honors covenant. I, and this is important. I want you to say this with me. God honors covenant. Because if he doesn't, then the covenant doesn't matter. But he does. And you're going to see that. God desires an undivided heart. You're going to see this in the story again. Because Israel goes on this yo-yo, back and forth, 
journey that we don't, right? Because once we get saved, we've got it all straightened out and we never have challenges or struggles, right? Yeah, I need to put the glasses on, right? Because I'm not seeing clearly. It isn't that we don't struggle. It isn't that we don't show up at the, at the shopping center and there's the liquor store, right? And there's the opportunity to make a poor choice. Those poor choices are always available to us. It's that we have a different relationship with the Father through the Son by the Spirit. Lastly, learn to enjoy Him first and allow all else in life to flow from that. We could park there. I love that. Jeff introduced that to us, I don't know, a couple, I don't know how many months ago now. Actually, I don't remember, but it, uh, yeah, thank you. 12 months at least. But when we, <laughs> I was actually thinking about this when we were worshiping, when, when everything else is just blocked out and we just learn to enjoy him. Everything else flows from that. Everything flows from that when we're connected to him. Okay, now we're going to go into some reading. So this is reading time with Skip. Got a couple of things highlighted. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. The operating assumption is that you're reading this yourselves and that you've already read it. So for those of you who have, this is going to be a bit of a repeat. I'm not going to go through the entire chapter. I've only pulled out ex um, excerpts. But let's begin. So we know Solomon is king at this point, right? So we know we went from Saul, who was the first king, and David, who was the second king. And that was a smooth transition, right? And Saul was an awesome choice. And remind me, whose idea was it to have a king? Yeah, it was ours, humankind. We needed one, everyone else had one. This is how my kids got smartphones. It was the same darn way. Everybody else has a smartphone. We need one. I can't function without it. And that's how we got Saul. And God said, You're, it's not going to turn out well, but okay, I'll do it. But it was part of the upper story. So remember, God's going to use this to advance his plan. So Saul, we know what happens. David, we know what happens. David's son Solomon is now king. We know he asked for wisdom. We know he had this glorious reign. And we also know at the end of the day, he didn't turn out so good. See, sometimes we forget that David, a man after God's heart, actually made some poor choices. Solomon, the son of David, who begged, or not begged, sorry, asked for wisdom and got it. Can you imagine God gave him wisdom and he still made bad choices? Because he's human. So now Solomon is getting toward the end of his reign. And through the prophet Ahijah, God told a rising young star in Solomon's administration by the name of Jeroboam. And so Jeroboam is going to be one of our main characters today. He told Jeroboam that he would be the future king. Actually, you could sit with that for a second and think, wow, God told me I'm going to be king and Solomon is still alive and he's still king. We kind of see a pattern there too because David was anointed, right, to become the king when he was a teenager and, and Saul was still alive. But God told him something a little interesting. He said God would give Jeroboam all but one of the tribes of Israel. So why did the kingdom split? Because God orchestrated the split. Now, the way it played out, so in the upper story, God has a plan. 
the way it plays out in the lower story, as you're going to see, is there's fighting, there's intrigue, there's plotting, there's killing. There's all sorts of nasty stuff happening in the lower story, but it's, but it's all congruent with the upper story. So after possibly, <laughs> I love that when I read this like for the fourth time, after possibly making a preemptive bid for the throne, Jeroboam learned to wait on God's timing. Solomon was not ready to relinquish the throne and tried to kill Jeroboam. We've seen this before. Isn't that interesting? The son of the one who had the same thing done to him is now attempting to do it to someone else. Man of wisdom, Solomon. But Jeroboam, another interesting one, is this a preview of what might happen later in time? I'm not going to make that claim, but it's interesting. Jeroboam fled where? To Egypt and waited. We know another story comes much later in the story where someone else flees to Egypt and waits. So Jeroboam fled to Egypt and waited there for an opportunity to make his move. So he's plotting, he's waiting. After Solomon died, his own tribe of Judah, because remember David is of the tribe of Judah. Solomon is of Judah. His own tribe of Judah automatically accepted his son Rehoboam. Automatically, succession. And by the way, something that was interesting, and I was actually researching this late last night, um, Jeff shared with us that David had 19 sons, 17? It, 19, that's what I thought. You know how many sons Solomon had? One. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines, one son, two daughters. Now, some scholars say, and even in the case of David, David had more than 19 sons, but the sons by the concubines or the lower wives didn't get counted. I'm not going to go into all that. I just find it very interesting that Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines, one son, and two daughters. It might have made life easier, actually, to not have all that drama. So they accepted his son Rehoboam as the next king. So it's like an auto selection. But much of the population, especially from the other tribes, well, of course, because they're not Judah, and they feel like Judah got preferential treatment, they had grown to resent Solomon's heavy taxation and conscripted labor and his grand projects. Again, and I'm going to need to be careful because I'm going to run out of time. I know it. We think of all the great things Solomon did. And he's known for his splendor and his grandeur and all the things that he accomplished. How did he do it? He overtaxed people. He treated them unkindly. At least economically, he was brutal. So they weren't happy. As representatives from all of Israel, so now all of Israel is all the tribes because we're still one unified sort of nation state. Is that right, Rachel? Or Rochelle, sorry. Um, Anyway, they're one unified people, but they're about to splinter. So they all come together and they say, all right, we're going to come together to, to, to make Rehoboam king, but we have a few complaints. And I'm not going to go into all the complaints because they're outlined a bit here. But Rehoboam, when he hears the complaints, decides to get some advice. So he goes to two different groups of people. Wisely, he goes to the elders. And he says, hey, they're complaining. What would you do? And the elders said, you know what? Listen, young buck. Slow down. Listen to what they're saying. You're young. You're the new kid on the block. Your dad did some pretty shady things. Listen to what they're saying and ease up. And he says, oh, that sounds good. But let me go get some advice for some, from some other people I trust. So he goes to his friends. 
young, inexperienced, clearly not wise in the end, and his friends say, oh, you're the king now. You don't have to listen to those old guys and probably guys, sorry ladies. You don't have to listen to them. In fact, you need to put your, your thumb down on these people and you need to establish your power. So after having gotten this advice, all of Israel comes back with Jeroboam. Now remember, Jeroboam's come back. He, he had been told by the prophet he's gonna be king. He's expecting something good to happen, I'm sure. So he had, they had come back, and the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. He acknowledges it. Yeah, he did. But I'm bigger and badder than my daddy, and I'm going to make it heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Chuck and I had fun with this because we know that that's not, they, Solomon didn't actually scourge them with whips, but his oppression was like being scourged. And if Rehoboam was going to one-up him, he had to do it with a more devastating methodology. And the methodology of the time in scourging was there was like scourging tool one and scourging tool two, which was the Scorpio. It's Latin. Oh, you'd like that, Rochelle. It comes from Latin, and it's just a worse scourging implement. And again, a foreshadow, if you will, of someone else we know that is going to be scourged in a horrible manner on our behalf, tying back to the upper story. We see clues to what's coming. So he basically says, I'm going to make it worse. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord. Now remember, God said this was going to happen if you break your part of the covenant. He made it clear, bad things are gonna happen. Not because I'm horrible and wrathful and angry and I just wanna do it, I'm just telling you, if you put your finger in that mouse trap, it's gonna snap on your finger. And don't blame me when it happens because I told you not to do it. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of, ne son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. So what ends up happening is voices say, Israel to your tents. In other words, let's get out of here. We don't want any part of this. You realize now that the kingdom is split. Rehoboam retreats to rule Judah to the south. I was going to put a map. Just visualize it in your mind, north and south. A lot of land north, less land south. Rehoboam, look at what he does. He retreats. We got to get out of here, y'all, quick. This didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to be. He doesn't say what happened to his younger friends who gave him the bad advice. While Jeroboam became king over Israel, just like God said he would. So that means he had 11 tribes. Judah had one. Rehob uh, yeah, Rehoboam had Judah. God had forewarned the kingdom would become divided. Why? In the upper story. Why? Because Solomon failed to, ke uh, to keep pagan worship outside the realm. This was the consequence playing out in the lower story. For two generations, oh, sorry, let me back up. Already divided in worship practices. Can I tell you that when we lose him spiritually, everything else falls? And by the way, you can't use everything else to gain him spiritually. Like, I'm going to run to con uh, for Congress, and I'm going to change politics, and in doing that, I'm going to become more spiritual. I'm not picking on politicians. I I I I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it well, and as I do that, I'm going to become more spiritual. It doesn't work that way. It works the opposite way. 
enjoy him and all else will flow. So already divided in worship practices, the nation now also became divided in politics, in priesthood, in security, in safety, in every aspect of their lives. It's crumbling around them. For two generations, Israel's army had been the pride of the region, her storerooms filled with precious metals, her people fed, her cities busy, and her temple active. In other words, they'd been flourishing when they kept covenant with God. But when they broke it, now, so the question the authors ask is, now what would happen to Israel and Judah? Split by disputes their leaders could not resolve. What's going to happen now? Well, I'll tell you, it ain't good. So encapsulating the, in, the, the coming years with the exception of one king we'll talk about, this is what happened. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. And by the way, when you hear me say jealous anger, I'm not talking about he just wants to it, the, the anger is driven because his very important people are rejecting him. His love is rejecting him. It's not, it's, not the, it's not because of the behavior. The behavior is just a symptom of the rejection. You see, when we reject him, we behave poorly. It's not the behavior that he's focusing on. It's the rejection. Okay? And by the way, that's still true today. It hasn't, that hasn't changed. He loves us. We are very important people to him. But it gets worse. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. Men were getting in on the act now. This prostitution thing was not limited only to women. Men were getting in. And, and here's the encapsulation, which really struck me again when Chuck and I were covering this yesterday, because it just dawned on me what was happening. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Do you remember in the story? We covered this a few weeks back. All of this preparation for the people, the very important people, to come into the land. God drove the people out. Not that he didn't love those people. He didn't love what they were doing. And so he cleanses the land for his people to come in and occupy, to worship him, to be in fellowship with him, to be in communion with him. And what did his people do? They invited it all back in. They invited it all back in. Now I will stand with you in front of the party store and the liquor store. and say, if I had gone into the liquor store in the hypothetical, turned away from God and what's best for me, I would be inviting back into my life something that is detestable for me. And don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't drink. I am saying don't drink to the point where you pass out. Don't remember how you got there. Don't know who you are. Put your life in danger and put your life on hold for how many years, Pam? Pam says a long time. Years don't, years don't compute. In other words, don't choose the detestable. But they did. They did. But let me remind you, God still honors covenant. God still honors covenant because when they turn back and they do, and we're going to talk about the one king who did, 
Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. Now, David wasn't actually Asa's father. Asa's a couple generations removed from David, but David is the, the king of Judah. David, it, Judah will always be David until the time of Christ, who becomes the Lion of Judah. Before that, David is sort of the Lion of Judah. So what did he do? He expel, expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. So da he comes in afterwards and, and, he, and he surveys and he goes, oh my gosh. And it, and it wasn't news to him. He grew up in it. He knew what was happening and he knew it had to be dealt with. He even deposed his grandmother, Makah, from her position as queen mother. Now you're getting personal. Because when you start, you know, telling grandma she can't do what she wants, and I'm not making light of it, it's even in his own family that he's got to make adjustments, right? Because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, are there, well, there are babies in the room, okay. Parents, kids. Asherah poles were phallic symbols, okay? Asherah was the goddess of fertility. In mythology, Asherah had bore 70 separate gods. So when people were praying to Asherah, when they were going to these Asherah poles, it was all about sex. It was all about reproduction. The reproduction part's not necessarily bad. I mean, the sex part's not necessarily bad, in covenant with God. So you see, taking something that is beautiful, wonderful, and making it detestable. And not only that, and Chuck said this, so all credit to you, Chuck, and rubbing God's nose in it. It's one thing to rush off to the temples. It's another thing to say, and now I'm going to build this pole just so it reaches up, up to you a little bit, God, so you can see it too. Can you, can you feel God's heart breaking? Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, he didn't take everything out, but watch. Asa's heart was fully committed to God all his life life, undivided heart, like his father David, an undivided heart, in covenant with the Father, and good things begin to happen again. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. So he begins to restore God's preeminence, God's importance, bringing the precious things back to the temple where God is. After 22 years as king of Israel, Jeroboam also died. So Asa's father had died, Jeroboam dies. Various kings reigned in Israel and Judah. Most of them did evil. We've already talked a bit about Asa, but I wanted to reiterate, Asa didn't stop there. He understood, this is at the very bottom, Asa didn't stop there, kicking his grandmother out, taking care of the idols. He understood that only the Lord God was worthy of worship, and he cleaned the entire land of Judah of its idols. And that's the point I wanted to emphasize. Asa didn't just recognize that things had gone south, to turn a phrase. He recognized that he had to cleanse. This is the same thing that God had done before they entered the land. Asa recognized that he had to clean it again. So it's not just the recognition that things aren't going well. You have to recognize why they aren't, and you have to, with the help of the Spirit, cleanse what needs to be cleansed. 
And when we get to the very end, when I'm going to give you the points and the practices, you'll see why this is important. So on the despicable side, Jeroboam's son, Nadab, you, you think they, it can't get worse, right? I mean, we got prostitution, they got Asherah poles, they got all this worship going on to other gods that aren't God, all going back to Solomon, allowing idolatry to come back in. Uh, Nadab did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following in the ways of his father. A man named Basha plotted against Nadab and killed the king. More intrigue, political infighting, murder. This is not God. This is despicable. He killed the king and Jeroboam's whole family. We're going to wipe everybody out so no one can have a claim to the throne, in part. Fulfilling God's prophecy through the prophet Ahijah, because earlier, and I didn't get into all that part, but if you've read it, if you've read scripture and you've read the story, you'll know it. It was prophesied because of Jeroboam and what he had done that his family was going to get wiped out. But Basha, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, was no better as a king. Likewise, Zimri, who also followed the evil ways of Jeroboam, killed his predecessor, King Elah, to get onto the throne. But Zimri, And these are the very important people of God doing these things. These are the people of God. So killed, uh, killed his predecessor to get on the throne, but Zimri had failed to calculate the popular support. This is the infamous reading of the tea leaves. Zimra didn't actually do his homework. And was in power all of seven days before burning himself to death in the palace and leaving the ashes of his discontent to Omri, the people's choice. So evidently the people had a different king in mind. I don't know what has to go on in your mind after a week of realizing that you're not wanted to actually want to burn yourself to death. I would say there's deep depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, all sorts of bad things happening. During his reign, Omri made the city of Samaria the capital of the northern region, and Samaria also came to signify the entire territory of the northern tribes. And again, as a precursor to what's to come, what do we know about the relationship ultimately between Jews and Samaritans? Doesn't turn out well. It's not going to turn out well until the one comes that can reunite the kingdom. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became the king of Israel. So Omri's gone. Asa's still king in the south. Omri reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. The answer to can it get worse is yes, it can get worse. They're finding ways to get worse. I can't even imagine how it's getting worse. Triple Asherah poles? I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but it's getting worse. He not only considered it trivial, excuse me, to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel. And we'll get to hear more about her next time. Daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. And we're going to learn more about Baal, another god in opposition, little g god, by the way, to our god. And now the king, because of his wife, is building places of worship for Baal. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, in a temple of Baal. Who else had a temple? God. He's literally compete, uh, setting up a competing religious system, almost mirroring what God had established for his very important people to worship him. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than all the kings of Israel before him. Okay. Whew. 
There's a lot going on. The one shining example of getting back to God is the one king in this series of kings that has an undivided heart and realizes that he's got to bring the people back into the covenant relationship with God, and that's Asa. So, you might wonder, what does all this mean? I actually took this. There's a study guide for the story, by the way, that I've been going through, and it has some really cool things in it. And so now for the note takers or for the photo takers, here are some things to to, to, to take time this week. Number one, thank God that he never gives up on us in spite of the historic failures and in the midst of our current failure, failures. And as we love to say, God doesn't love us in spite of our sin. He loves us in the midst of our sin. And by the way, he's still loving the people that we were just describing. He never stopped loving ever. He can't. Trivia question, what's the one thing God can't do? The one thing he can't do is stop loving us. He can't. That's almost what's heartbreaking about it in a way. He can't. He can't help himself. Number two, thank God for the people he has placed in your life who have real wisdom and are willing to share it. He has folks in this room, folks who aren't in this room, for you online watching this later, he's put people in your life to listen to. Listen to them. Always test the spirit. Always test the spirit. But listen to the wise people that he's put in your life. They're there for a reason. Number three, pray for healing in broken it should be or, sorry, not for, fractured relationships that he will restore them. Look, we've all got broken and fractured relationships. Every single one of us do. Pray for restoration. Pray for restoration. Okay, so those are some things we can take time to focus on. Now, there are three questions that we can meditate on. Number one, am I a peacemaker or a source of conflict in my relationships? And how can I seek to build bridges and heal relationships in my life? Am I the problem or am I part of the solution? Number two, when I am placed in situations where I am called to be a leader or influencer, do I do it with humility? Am I a humble servant? I may have the right answer for you, but if I just put it in your face, not in love and actually uninvited, that is not healing, that is not bringing forth life. It's actually destructive. Then number three, and this is the hard one. Are there any idols in my life, even little ones? If so, what can I do to cast them out? We all have them. Don't look at me and shake your head like you don't, because you do. And if LSU does not beat Florida tonight, or actually this afternoon, I will be heartbroken. Well, actually, they have another game. I'll be heartbroken if they lose two in a row. I'm kidding. I won't be heartbroken. But there are those who will be. I promise you. And this is where those wise people in your life can help. Help me see where maybe I'm making something more important than it should be. 
which by the way is an idol. <laughs> so don't think it has to be an Asherah pole. It doesn't. Okay. Personal action. I actually have given you a lot of homework. I would say I'm sorry, but I'm not. But this is where our VIP band comes in again. And it's so interesting because this came out of the study guide. This wasn't something I came up with. You know here we love being part of the broader body. We're part of the ecumenical church. In fact, again, this morning we prayed for another church because we know we're not the only one. We're part of the one. Let me say that again. We know we're not the only one. We know we're part of the one. One ecumenical church, right? This week, so one of the most divisive organizations in the history of the world, sadly, has been the church. It's true, y'all. Just read history or watch the news. It's not historic. It is historic, but it hasn't ended. As you move about our community in the coming week, commit to pray for every church you pass. And do that however the Spirit leads you. I'm not saying pull your car over, get out, get on your knees, you know, roll out a blanket or something. But if, if God tells you to do that, do that. But at a minimum, as you pass it by, pray for it. Pray for its people. Ask for God's blessing and guidance for these brothers and sisters. They are very important people. Very important people. Okay, let me wrap up. Mm, sorry, there we go. Yeah, let me hurry up and wrap up. Here's what I'll leave you with as I pray us out and invite the, who's doing profession? Oh, Tito, you can go ahead and come up. Interestingly enough, I want to share with you how the spirit works. I shared with a few people about the VIP uh, wristbands that we're wearing and people were saying, well, what, what does this VIP stand for? What does this stand for? Why are we doing it? So I gave them sort of a preview of what was going to happen. In the course of, I don't know, Marla, 10 minutes between you, um, Barb, and other people, the VIP became, and I love this, Vineyard Voices Victorious in Prayer. Victorious in Prayer. Prayer is where it all starts. So God bless you. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you online. And let me turn it over to Tito.